I come to you all now, dear listeners, with an offering, an opportunity to join our rather unique family. The Night Mother bids you all welcome to a world of monsters, madness, and magic. Halt, criminal scum! I see you, trying to illicitly listen to monsters, madness, and magic. Pay the fine, or pay with your blood! Yeah, do Yeah, no! I've been murdered. Slash and cast. All right, folks. Welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin. Here with a quick word before we dive in. Now on this episode, Daniel and I chat with actor Wes Johnson about Bethesda, Elder Scrolls, Lucian Lachance, the early days of voice acting, becoming the PA announcer for the Washington Capitals, and getting a championship ring, and more. As always, everyone, thanks for listening, and without further ado, Hail Sithis. You sleep rather soundly for a murderer. That's good. You'll need a clear conscience for what I'm about to propose. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, magic. <laughs> well, Wes, we don't do anything fancy here, so I guess just to give us a platform to leap from, take us back to when you were a youngster. You know, were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, all the above? As a kid, I was a reader. I read everything I could get a hold of. Read the three investigator books, comic books, anything I could get my hands on. In fact, sometimes my friends would tease me for not wanting to go outside because I was caught in the middle of a of a novel or a book, and I wanted to see how those things ended. You know, <laughs> I, I was stuck right here inside my own head and imagination station. I didn't need to go outside. What were some of your personal favorite things to read? What were you picking up? Hardy Boys? No, no, not the Hardy Boys. It was not a Hardy Boys. It was the Three Investigators, which was the uh, Alfred Hitchcock uh, oh, okay. version of that. They had, uh, I think, Jupiter Jones, Pete Crenshaw, and Bobby Andrews. And that was uh, a lot cooler for me. I enjoyed those books a lot. That was like the first series of, uh, of things. I got hooked on it in school. We read one of the books in school. And then I just went out and started getting a collection or something like 25 books. So I think I've, I've found some of them since and collected them and gotten some of the old hardbacks. But they, I don't think they're necessarily in print anymore. I'm not familiar with them. I've never even heard of oh, them. Oh, it's actually. worth it. Go check it. Jupiter Jones was like a sort of a heavy set brainy kid, uh, smarter than your average bear kind of guy who liked to solve the crimes. Pete Crenshaw was the more athletic. Bobby at first had a brace on his leg and was a lot more studious. Uh, they changed a little as they got a little bit older and grew into themselves, but it was uh, it was pretty interesting. And the reason that they Alfred Hitchcock was a part of it is they ran into Alfred Hitchcock in the first book and he sort of led them into uh, a mystery. Yeah, that's right up my alley. I'm going to check that out for real. So you read books. Was it any TV shows? Or Star Trek. Star Trek. Uh, I was waiting yeah. on that. <laughs> I was a big Star Trek fan when I was a kid. Doctor Who, Star Trek, anything like that. You know, Lost in Space. Hey, it was a pain, the pain. Although I was a Will Robinson fan, not Doctor Smith. I always thought Doctor Smith was a pain in the caboose when I was a kid when I was Will Robinson's age, but Jonathan Harris is a very good actor and I grew to appreciate him as I grew older, but I'm still a, a, a Bill Mummy fan, Bill Mummy fan. He's uh, I follow him on uh, Facebook. He's a musician now, you know, he did the, uh, he also did some parody songs that were on Dr. Demento for years, like Fish Heads with Barnes and Barnes. That's how I uh, recognize Will that Mummy. name. Our Bill Mummy, yeah. I recognize the name whenever you said it. Well, I've got many other pop culture references that are going to fly right over your head. So just <laughs> strap down. Teach the kids the Three Stooges. Hopefully they don't replicate that in the house. 
If they do, they're only hitting above the eyes with the fingers never actually poking in the eyes. You got to teach them that right away. It's one of the first things you teach them. All those old vaudevillian guys who first started out in the movies and started doing the talkies and taking the shtick that they did on stage and putting it into the films, not all of them translated as well. You know, we still remember the Stooges to this day, you know. Were you a theater or a drama kid at all growing up? Is that how your interest in art sort of? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I was into drama. I did theater. Loved to perform. Loved to get up on the stage all the way through school. And, uh, you know, I also also used to watch all the Warner Brother cartoons. You're like, did I listen to the old radio programs? The thing for me is this guy right here, Mel Blanc. Mm. You know, this is a great autobiography of this guy. That's not all, folks. It's a wonderful book. Mel Blank was one of my heroes. And I used to love the old time radio programs. I'd listen to them where uh, Ed Walker used to play them late at night and you'd listen to them. And just radio programs, they touch a certain part of your imagination that television doesn't because it's giving you everything and you just sit back and let it wash over you but when it comes to a radio program you're seeing the entire world there's no special effects budget that can top what your brain can create it was only like four dollars and 25 cents and the reason they said it was in okay condition but somebody wrote on the inside of it so I thought I just wanted it to read it because I had a copy once by the time and I loaned it to somebody and I never got it back and I wanted to talk to some of my, I teach a voice acting class. I wanted to talk to some folks about Mel Blank and show them this book. And then I got it and I found out what was written on the inside. It's autographed by Mel Blank. So that was the best $4.25 <laughs> I spent on Amazon in a long time. That was pretty nice. And somebody out there, there's somebody named Phil is like, where's my book? And I have other people whose friends name are Phil and they're like, that was for me. Right? <laughs> You're going to get that for me? It's like, no, that's not going to happen, Phil. But I mean, I'm a huge Mel Blanc fan. I remember going to visit his grave out in LA. Uh, he's got a headstone there that says, that's all, folks, mm. right on the front of it. I was giving him a red, a, a white rose. Someone gave me a rose at a comedy show we were doing the night before. And I'm staying at a place that I'm renting for a few weeks while I'm out there and I'm thinking I don't know what I'm going to do with a rose well, I don't know I'll give it to Mel I'll take it over to Mel so I went out to his grave and I put a stone on there and I set the rose and just chatting with Mel Blank and I just said you know if you were here today I wonder what you might say to me and suddenly I heard from outside the other side of the hedges they have these big bushes that go about eight feet tall that circle the entire cemetery and I heard a novelty car horn go off just at that very moment goes da 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 Da, 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 da. and all the goose flesh just starts to crawl up my arm and i'm like okay mel great thanks for talking to me i'll talk to you later you have a great day see you bye <laughs> i started thinking of uh, speedy gonzalez and all of that so you know but it's just uh, a novelty car horn going off at that very moment the timing could not have been better awesome <laughs> right you just mentioned that you were a teacher Wes. Uh, when you go to teach a voice acting class what's the first lesson you want your students to to take i just it? want them to get used to their instrument we go through different exercises to get them used to their instrument because a voice is not just a voice it's uh you, you use your entire body in voice acting you use your face you use everything you would normally use in acting in voice acting so and, and you have to it's it's not about reading lines it's about living the moment so that's what we spend our time talking about and doing. And for me, when I get into my characters, that's what I do. I try to live in the moment with each one of them, that they tend to get very close to you that way. I'm curious, you mentioned Mel Blanc. So what was it that got you into voice acting? I was just curious if it was like it was a sequence of events, if it was like a childhood epiphany, or was it just sequentially you just kind of found your way into it? No, so, I mean, I, I was doing stand-up comedy. I was doing sketch comedy. I was doing different voices on stage. I was doing a number of different characters. And the I started working at a radio station, WHFS in Washington, D.C., and started doing some of those things there. And, you know, I would start creating little audio dramas on the stage. I love audio dramas and things of that sort. So for me to create my own little things and started working on the morning show and my own little comedy sketches, which I've already been doing on stage, you know, starting with stand-up, then doing the sketch comedy and doing improv, then taking that and putting it into a radio and learning the production side of things to create my own little worlds, my own audio worlds, and to make comedy uh, every morning was great. And then uh, I started working on uh, the Wolfman Jack show with Wolfman Jack. I worked with him for nice. two years doing a national show. And I'd get to write like these four comedy sketches every week that I would take to Wolf and throw them in front of him and be like, ah, 
that. That's great, baby. Oh, this book. Come here, Wes. That's great stuff. Give you a great big <laughs> hug. And you get moving on into your night. And I'd have my little uh, microphone and my cockpit with all my special effects. And we would do it live from either. First, we started at Hard Times, uh, Hard Rock Cafe, Hard Rock Cafe downtown in D.C. Then we moved to uh, Planet Hollywood. So, you know, live from Planet Hollywood, it's Wolfman Jack Show. I've got a big sign over on the wall over here still where it's uh, still presenting Wolfman Jack. But, you know, you do those things. Then you start doing songs. And I would do some songs that end up on Dr. Demento. And then you start doing films. And I've discovered that work begets work. The more you do, the more people want to talk to you. And since I was already doing stuff with film and commercial, and I'd done a few animated uh, cartoon voiceover type things, I started getting calls to audition for video games. And once you start getting involved and do a couple characters with video games, people want to talk to you about doing more of them because if, if you, the more characters and different voices you can create and be and inhabit, the better. So when it comes to radio specifically, what's something that is difficult about radio that maybe us from the outside looking in wouldn't think about? It's different than it used to be. Since the uh, telecom bill first happened, uh, this is back during the Clinton administration. It was basically the equivalent of a neutron bomb. You know, it, it destroyed all the people, but it left the suits standing. And everybody's allowed to have multi different, uh, instead of having a number of different radio stations owned by different entities and many opportunities for grassroots people to come in and, and practice and do different things on the airwaves, you now have like a couple of companies owning every single radio station and running them like a cookie cutter kind of situation. So it makes it very difficult for anybody to do the kind of things that I was doing, to come in and be creative, to be funny, to be to, to create theater of the mind on the air. Because then you can't just, you also can't just do it locally or in the moment. It has to be done over, if you get successful with it, it's over many different stations. And not many people are thinking of radio the way they used to, where it used to be an entertainment. Like you do, you're talking about how you love old style radio and radio programs and things of that sort. That's not happening on the air anymore. They'll get somebody comes on with their hot take and starts getting into an argument so that you will yell and you'll pick up the phone and go, I think you're an idiot and I'm an idiot, so I'm going to debate you on it. <laughs> and uh, that's basically what radio has become today. There used to be places like when I was with HFS, uh, HFS used to be one of the places where you could break music, especially early on. Back in the days, when it was one of 2.3 and you had alternative rock. And it was one of the legendary alternative rock stations on the East Coast, like uh, K-Rock was out in L.A. And there are little bastions of that. But you're finding that people who will take a chance on music and play stuff and the DJs no longer have anything to do with it, man. It's uh, the, they'll hire a music director who is very much steered by the consultants who are hired by the corporate entities who will try to make all of their stations play the same things because our numbers tell you this is what you want to hear. And you'll hear the same 10, 15 songs over and over again, which then lends us and leads us to satellite radio. And satellite radio used to be commercial free. Not so much anymore, man. No. Go try to listen to some of the talk stations or the sports stations on uh, satellite radio that you are paying for. It's about a third radio advertisement, but it seems more like two thirds. Let's talk about who's going to be starting at running back this week. We got a couple of different chances, but we'll be right back after these 42 messages from our sponsors. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the secret to how he started and climbed top as soon as yeah. we get back. It's like, oh, <laughs> screw yeah. you. Or it says, and I've got all the methods for how you can make it. Fit. Really? Yep. And I'll be going over that in the next two hours. So stay with it. It's, like, it's wait, very yeah, important it's you listen ass. to those messages, Daniel, because they're going to treat your erectile dysfunction or get you some <laughs> oh, life insurance, damn. even though you're overweight and on pills and on your fourth or fifth <laughs> wife. They're going to get you. Uh, and, and more important than that, more important than that, it's going to be we need you to gamble away every bit of money that you're making right now. You want to win some money? You're not going to do it here. We're going to take your cash. But don't worry about it. You're going to have a good time. If they advertise heroin like that, something very addictive, heroin, smack, you'll have a good time. Everybody loves it. It'll bring you down. It'll pick you up. It's wonderful. Addiction to heroin? Call 1-800-JUNKIE. I mean, they, they advertise. That's sugar. <laughs> 
So I'm up in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. I do things I call hockey games for the Washington Capitals for the past 22 years. So, you know, I know that the Avalanche just won, but I still got one of these for myself. Stanley Cup championship ring there. So that's kind of nice. How'd you fall into that? Well, it's the best ring that um, was ever given to me by an uncle, Uncle Ted uh, Leonsis, who owns the Capitals. I'm the announcer. I'm the I'm the guy who says things like Capitals goal scored by number eight Alex Ovechkin. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I've been doing that for his whole career, and you know it's it's been kind of a record-setting career for him, and I've yeah. uh, kind of enjoyed the trip along the way. It's nice. How did you find yourself into that job? Well, I was doing the morning show over at uh, Extra 104, and Jawan Howard from the Bullets at the time mm-hmm. was on our radio show, and we got a certificate from some award show. And I took it over to drop it off for Jawan at the front office, and as I was walking out, I said, hey, you have an opening at PA announcer. I'd love to audition. And they go, oh, well, the guy who's been here for 20 years just left. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> We're having an audition next week. Did you want to sign up? And I was like, yeah, uh, sure. And I signed up and I ended up becoming the last PA announcer of the Bullets, first of the Wizards. When they had a lockout, I went to California for a while. And while I was in California, they came back from the lockout. I wasn't back right away, so they hired somebody else. The next year, I had an opportunity to audition for the Capitals and uh, the hockey team, who I'd filled in for a couple of times along the way. Even one of their playoff series uh, on the way to their first Stanley Cup Finals, which they lost every game, unfortunately, to the Detroit Red Wings that year. Got swept out of the uh, Stanley Cup. But I came back and I auditioned and I got the job. So now I'll be starting my 22nd year as the announcer for the Capitals uh, starting up in uh, the in October this year. What a chance. You just asked and there it was. That's the way it is in life. You have to ask. You Here's the thing. Preparation plus opportunity, right? That's- you have to be able to go after these things. I had a, a comic strip that I wrote and drew, a daily comic strip for the Washington Times for about two years. And the reason I stopped is they only paid me about $35 a week. And I was doing 26 <laughs> hours of work to get this done. And I wanted to get it syndicated, couldn't get it syndicated. I was already now doing a full-time job at a radio station, had a family, and I just couldn't do it anymore. However, if you want something enough and you put the passion into it, you can succeed. You got to just be willing to bang your head against the wall. You got to be willing to be rejected, to fail. And if you're willing to risk failure, if you're willing to risk someone saying no, the sky's the limit. But the thing is, you're supposed to learn more from your failures than you are from your successes. I have learned I'll probably fail again. You follow your heart, but you let your head set the directions. Yeah, you got to work in concert. If you just totally go with your heart, but you're not paying attention, just letting yourself throw yourself into something without planning, that doesn't always work out. However, (laughs) if you throw yourself 100% your heart into something and your head goes, here's how people have done this in the past, how they succeeded. Let me do a little research. You know what? I got you. Let me be your wingman heart. Let brain be your wingman here. You know what I mean? The brain (laughs) has got to be the wingman on many parts of your body. (laughs) Otherwise, if you don't don't listen to the wingman, you can find yourself in a lot of trouble in me yeah <laughs> a lot of trouble <laughs> yeah that is an interesting trajectory though for most of the voice actors that we've talked to it's kind of sort of the same thing so, oh yeah i just talked to him and he said hey you want to be in a game next thing you know i'm voicing for i'm the master chief for Halo. it's not really but it's <laughs> usually like that the end which is strange like that that's the, the the original voice and they're able to deepen it up just for the characters <laughs> right or you know so i just walked out the store and i said hey i'd love to be your voice and george lucas said why don't you come and be a voice for Darth Vader? It's you're, like, th- you're, and, you're making me think that Gomer Pyle is the world's greatest voiceover actor. <laughs> and, well, and, and I sure enough, I'm not saying it's a god damn. So no, that's not anyway. what he said, Shazam. I think you got that quote just a little bit wrong. It's just interesting because most of the people we talk to, and it just it leads down, it's this domino of, next thing you know, they had the CBS well, see, receipt. Yeah, but see, I was movie. doing... I was doing already a morning show on radio because I had a tendency. I was doing stand-up comedy and doing impressions and going out to clubs and met some of the guys at the radio stations. How I got the job the first time at the radio station was I was doing stand-up comedy. And I was doing a contest that 
they graded me, they gave me a five point penalty on my final score because I went over my allotted time because the sound guy messed up the sound and I had to improvise from it until he got it back on track with my girlfriend up in the sound booth ready to kill him at the time. <laughs> and so <laughs> my gut is hurt. I'm hurt yeah. for you, man. I'm hurt. So for I you. lost I lost by three points. The winner of this uh National Lampoon contest went on to go on to Showtime. I lost by three points and didn't go on to Showtime. However, the guy who was one of the judges, his name was Weasel on HFS. I heard him on the radio the next day, and he's like, Wes Johnson got ripped off. He was ripped off. He should have won. He had then. And I thought, oh, my God, I got to go thank Weasel. That was very nice of him. And I went down to talk to Weasel, and there's a guy named David Einstein who was the program director and a morning show guy at the time. And he looks at me, and he goes, so you're a funny guy, huh? I said, well, I, I, I try to be a funny guy. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you like to do news? Oh, Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that you had to be funny for that, but yeah, I'll do that. They had the, the news person was leaving for on a vacation for like two weeks and they had nobody to fill in. So I came in and started filling in the news and I worked there for one day. Actually, I trained with her for the week. Then the one day I did, the next day coming in, the car that I was driving stalled on the highway, just on the highway, right outside this big building where the radio station was. And I'm in the right lane of a two lane highway trying to restart the engine so i put it in neutral somebody comes up behind me paying no attention whatsoever i suddenly hear them slamming their brakes on squealing tires hits me bam at about 60 from the rear it was a pickup truck i was in so the back of my head goes through the window and then off the front of the uh, steering column and the vehicle spins like a 380 in the middle of the road when it stops i'm getting out all wobbly and I feel like it's all these teeth falling out of my mouth because there's wet and all this. And it turns out it was glass because the glass <laughs> from the back window, my teeth were still there, but the glass was falling. So I'm like, okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make sure we're all good. Go check the guy in the car behind me. He's still sitting behind the wheel as I'm wobbling over to make sure he's all right. He's crying. I'm like, what are you crying for, buddy? You had two lanes. You chose the wrong one. <laughs> so I ended up walking from this accident after the police came, took the radio out of the car, wasn't thinking. I had a head injury, so I took the face off the radio. It was just the face off the radio. I didn't take the whole radio, just the face. Got the radio. <laughs> and I make my way over to the station. Well, the guy, David Einstein, who's doing the morning show at the time, is about ready to go in. And suddenly, he sees this guy with all this blood running down his face, walking up towards him. And he's like, can I help you? And it's like, hey, it's Wes. What? So I end up going inside and he's like, you got to go to the hospital. I'm like, no, we got to make the news. So we go inside. I'm putting together the newscast. First newscast, I'm standing there with my papers in my hand, reading the news and blood with every heartbeat is shooting out of my nose onto the paper while David's going, just watching all this happen. So he, he's like, okay, Wes, you're a trooper. I really do appreciate you coming in, making this. You've made an impression. Go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going to the hospital, and uh, I showed back up again the next day and kept that job and turned it into doing comedy on the morning show and got my own show later in the evenings and worked there for several years, turned it into working with Wolfman Jack, got my own morning show on a different station after a while. And it's just you you look for opportunities as i mentioned to you before work begets work every opportunity you take it completely seriously but it doesn't mean that that's everything and all you're going to do if you have talents to do other things that will rise like cream you'll get a chance to do it and just it seemed like looking at your your resume it's cool that you you ended up in a niche you know parallel to it but you know you just ended up becoming like a sports caster things like that whereas other voice actors we talked to they just gone from one game to the next game to the next game to the day and you spend oh, 30 yeah. seconds scrolling through their resume list on imdb and and it's just to see you you're like Root, jumped into that lane you were shea gorath and you just impacted like the specific time period of my life and many people other our lives just played just because of the elder scrolls and then you juked off the off ramp and next thing you know you're announcing for hockey I mean, it's just well, cool. I, but i was doing all that all along i was doing hockey when i did oblivion and was playing the arena announcer and mark lampert who was the director said why don't you do what you normally do uh, for the caps games only on steroids these guys are like gladiators and so i yes. pumped that up and because i pumped it up for the uh gladiators in oblivion i actually started pumping it up a bit more for the actual nhl 
And for a while there, because I was bringing an edge and I was unleashing the fury and doing all this stuff that was like just bringing attitude and energy and pumping up the arena and getting people fired up. It was not necessarily what the PA announcers of old used to do. And you have some of the old school guys who be like, this young punk, this little rebel thinks he's going to come in and change things. Well, what started happening was as those guys started leaving, new guys started coming in were acting more like i did Mm. suddenly after so many years of doing this i'm no longer the young punk rebel i'm old school how did that happen (laughs) i mean i continue to do the acting i do the the video game acting all along i've been doing films tv work on like veep and i was on homicide and i just did a pilot this past summer it didn't get picked up but i did a pilot worked with ed asner for a while on a on a show i did uh i'm going to be making a star trek film in the fall where i'm going to be playing a klingon i've done klingons in star trek video games before but i've never actually worn the walnut head until now and some people <laughs> now head. see the makeup test of me wearing the walnut head and they're like that is a much better look for you wes <laughs> <laughs> what was your most fun role like what role was it oh well that you had the most fun doing probably a dirty shame the john waters movie i mean who's not going to love being in a john waters movie i was a biker uh, i weighed a, i weighed t- about 200 pounds more than i weigh right now and i played a biker by the name of fat fuck frank and they had they had tattoos on my arms and selma blair was my girlfriend she was ursula utters with uh, <laughs> out to here her mother was tracy ullman i was in johnny knoxville's gang that was a trip that movie was just a a, a real trip and a blast to do and i'm talking about you know sylvia yeah you know, miss stickles uh Ursula's famous uh, she's she's a star she got the biggest tatas on Hereford road <laughs> That was a that was a fun movie to do, and it was kind of like I mean everybody was so cool on that set. It was like going back to one of the I felt like I was in the drama department again back in high school. You go sit at lunch with Chris Isaac, and he's telling you tales of other lunches he's had with Paul McCartney and Roy Orbison. You're like, well, you can invite them to come eat with us too. That's okay. We're cool with that. <laughs> Hanging out with Tracy Ullman, who was like, had always been a hero of mine. And then she asked me one day for a ride from one of the rehearsals back to Flight 3 in Baltimore. And I'm like, did I clean my car? Did I clean my car? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Specifically with Bethesda, how was that just your typical audition and you got the role? And obviously they like what you did because you you keep coming back. My first first one I did, I don't know if I auditioned. They may have been looking for a group of people who are very versatile and flexible. And they went through central casting in Washington, D.C. And I was one of about 10 people that got hired for Morrowind. And they brought me in to play the Bretons and the Orcs and uh, certain, I think I was Merun's Dagon and uh, a couple of other of the uh, Daedric princes and the gods. And th- that was actually directed by Todd Howard back then. So, you know, going in and, and, and working with those characters uh, was a great introduction, but I, I ended up having to audition to come back for Oblivion. But here's the thing. Having then played about 600 hours of Morrowind, just getting completely (laughs) addicted into the game and absorbed and feeling the immersion of what that whole thing is like changed the way I voiced games for the rest of my life. Really? So, yeah, I mean, it really did. I mean, at one point I'm coming in and I'm like, oh, yes, we've been expecting you. Come right in. Tell us a bit about yourself. Someone steals your sweet roll. What (laughs) will you do? So... I that I play that character and evidently every character sounded just like him throughout all the Bretons sound exactly like very thin gene pool. But <laughs> they didn't know if they want me to do Bretons again in the next one. So I auditioned with a different voice for the Imperials. And they liked what I did being the Imperial Guard and bringing a certain edge to the guard. And that got me in to play all the Imperials. And then somewhere along the way, Mark Lampert, who was the director at the time, says, this guy's a little bit different. He's a little more evil. Maybe we should play him darker. And that was Lucien Lachance. And he was the first of the characters that I had ever voiced, that I had ever voiced for one of the Bethesda games that was different from the main race that I was doing. You know, all the orcs sounded alike, all the... uh, 
Breton sounded alike. All the Imperial sounded alike until Lucian Lachance. And because he was different, it really made an impression on people. And by the time we started doing Shivering Isles and I became Shea Gorath and a number of different people, we were doing different voices. Shivering Isles was very different. It was a real trendsetter and it broke a lot of the <laughs> yeah. original molds of what had been going on. And I think that's a lot of people think, well, Bethesda's doing the same thing. They're doing this and that. They have broken molds every step along the way. Mm. It just gets so... You, you play that so much of it like skyrim was a huge leap above oblivion <laughs> and yet yeah. you've now played it so long and played it so much that when you got the 10th anniversary just came out and i bought the 10th anniversary and i plugged it in to my xbox series x and it was like playing a brand new game again i was hooked again into the game yep. you know so much of my life has been taken into those games <laughs> i know exactly what you mean you're going to play for about a half an hour before you go to bed and the next thing you know ass. the birds are chirping yep. outside and your day is toast you, you play so long that when you finally get up to have to use a restroom you're like oh my god i'm vapor locked <laughs> I've waited so long i don't know if i'm going to be able to go i i, I will say this i think that Morrowind was better than, uh, I mean, Oblivion was better than Morrowind in one reason and one reason only. No cliff racers. I hate cliff racers. <laughs> <laughs> Those flying winged buzzards coming out wherever you're at trying to make your way across the countryside and they're like, bat, 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 bat. It's refreshing. We talked to a decent amount of voice actors, and not many of them, especially ones that work in a lot of video games, have played the games that they've worked in. But it's, you said you put 600 hours into Morrowind. That's a lot. I put a lot of hours into a lot of different games. And, and one of the, you know, people are like, do you do it just to hear your voice? And it's like, no, 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 no. I do listen to when my characters come in. But you see, when we're voicing a game, sometimes a lot of these voices and these moments are broken up. A lot of separate quotes. So I want to hear how it work, works together. Right. Is right. it immersive? Does it sound realistic? Is it Does it keep me in the moment? So I listen for that maybe for the first time. But as I'm going through, then the character that I'm playing becomes the one that I focus on. Right. Not the NPCs, just the PC, you know, me playing. Although I will say one of the cool things about Oblivion is that I played as an Imperial. So all the effort sounds and fighting sounds were <laughs> actually me. That is cool. So that's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> you mentioned that Lucian specifically was the first one that you did that was new and original. So how did you approach it initially? How did you want to want him to uh, sound? When I thought about Lucian and he wanted him darker, I started thinking about what does this guy look like? And so he had to be in my head something. And he didn't look like he eventually looked in the game. In my head, he was gaunt with dark circles under his eyes and hair that was long and stringy and a little bent. The little evil dear child, see this. Right, mother, she loves you, Justin. She loves you, and yet she wants blood. So I play with this character, and then they take him and put him in the body of this gorgeous guy, looks like Benjamin Bratt, and all the women are like, oh my God, <laughs> gorgeous and has a heart of darkness, the perfect man. <laughs> so and everybody's like, were you surprised when you found out what happened to him? I'm like, yeah, because I didn't know until I was playing the game. All I know is I ran out of lines. Didn't have any lines to read anymore. <laughs> Anything that happens to him happens off camera, you know? There's never any scene where they're like, okay, now we're going to take this melon baller and slowly remove your melon balls. No, that never <laughs> happened. Not No voices like that were ever recorded. So, Have you ever done much motion capture for voice acting or Elder Scrolls specifically? No, I haven't done much motion capture. I mean, I'm now at the point where I could. I'm a very trim fella. I weigh about 170 pounds and I'm lean, mean, fighting machine. But back in the day, I was like 360 pounds. You know, unless, of course, they were trying to do motion capture for Job of the Hut, I was not necessarily the best <laughs> candidate for the job. Also, I have to say, when you weigh that much, uh, skin tight spandex with ping pong balls all over it is not a flattering look. It's not a flattering look anyway for anybody. There, nobody, everybody says, Oh, this makes me look good. It doesn't. It really doesn't. <laughs> Has the recording process itself changed for you at all in the, let's say you started well, in 2003 ish? Well, 
there is the booth right there. Mm. Whereas I didn't necessarily have that when I started out. I'd be going into a lot of studios. And we'd go into studios and we'd meet with folks like uh, with Morrowind. I was there with Todd in the studio at Absolute Pitch and Chip Ellinghouse. And we'd go down during a break to the O Bampan and get a little uh, chocolate croissant and some uh, coffee or something. And then uh, later they started bringing a booth into Bethesda itself. So we'd go into the studios at Bethesda and do some recording there. Other places, there are studios all around, everywhere. Whether I was doing it in L.A., whether I was doing it here, you're going into studios. But a lot of that started going by the wayside as some of the bigger studios started falling back when people started getting home studios. And then the pandemic hit and nobody could go anywhere. So thank goodness, I mean, I'm able to just sit right here in my home, record from here, you use Source Connect, you can plug right into a studio anywhere in the world. I do know that there was one time I did some recording for somebody who was in Hong Kong at one hour, and then there's somebody in LA at another hour, and I'm on the East Coast, and we're all at different places in the world at different times of the day, and yet we're working on the same project. I mean, technology is kind of grand. Right, right. If you could go back in time and perhaps take a second approach to a role, what role mm. would that be? Ooh, take a second approach at a, at a role. I think I would go back. I would love to go back and vary up some of the Bretons. I would have liked to have made some of the Bretons sound a little different from each other. I love the, the race voices and everything, but if we were able to go back in time and do some different voices for some of those characters, I would love that. And I would love it if they were all me. <laughs> what I what I like, <laughs> people are like, you're all over the place in Oblivion. You're playing all these characters. But the thing that makes me happy is until people saw that in IMDb, they didn't know that those were all me. They, I mean, the Imperial voices, yeah, they could tell, but they didn't know I was the announcer, didn't know that I was also Lucian and Shea Gorath and Hermaeus Mora. Hermaeus Mora, Dragonborn. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> they didn't know these things. And then to go do Fallout and uh, be able to be... Fox and the super mutants. And then Mo Cronin from Diamond City. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the, the Silver Shroud, Mistress of Mystery. <laughs> and to be as many different characters as I want to be, I love that. I love the opportunity to play. It's like when I was a kid, I didn't just read the books. I had a little tape cassette recorder. One of the best gifts I ever got as a kid. Little tape cassette recorder. And I'd sit there and I'd record voices and my own little shows and little voices and people talking back and forth to each other. And that's what I tell people. I say, if you want to voice things, keep voicing. Practice, practice, practice. Don't just think you're only going to voice when somebody comes to you with a role. You got to want to just do it. It's got to be there, part of your every day. And besides, if you're continually rolling with the tape, like I did, you may hear your mother in the background get really angry and yell, you better shut up. <laughs> and you catch that on tape and then you keep rolling it back on you better shut up you better shut up you better shut up and your mother goes you better stop that <laughs> <laughs> well Wes, we're not going to keep you all evening here so i guess just to wind down and put a cherry on top is there anything on the horizon you can tell us about anything in the pocket? well i'm like yeah, I said, I got the Star Trek film uh, that I'm going to be working on. It's called Farragut Forward. It's a, a Star Trek fan film, and they've had some really cool guests appear there before. Uh, Walter Koenig, who was Chekhov in the original Star Trek, has been a guest of theirs. Stan Lee was in one of their episodes, and and now the Mighty have fallen, and they're they're settling for me. That's that's kind of cool. I've enjoyed that. I've done a couple of little films. One called Thank You, which is in doing the circuits right now it's in the festivals as well as one called celtic cross and we're working on making that into a feature called whiskey and words there are a couple things that i'm looking towards doing that may happen in la in the fall and then there are other things that you're just never allowed to talk about mm. <laughs> uh because lawyers are listening lawyers are on call right now <laughs> All I want, all I want, I mean, the Caps are going to be playing again in the fall. I'll be doing the Caps again. I'm going to be calling in the in August some uh, professional tennis matches for the uh, City Open. Did that last year. It was great. Got to announce folks like Rafael Nadal, and uh, it was just uh, very, very cool. So, actually, it was very, very hot. It's August. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm very lucky in that there are a number of different projects that I could uh, get involved with and work on. I do love them all. And the world is opening up again. So now we get a chance to go back out. And I've, I just did Awesome Con 
and I'm going to maybe do MAGFest in the fall. And then next year, here's one thing you're going to want to do. You want to go visit some, hang out with voice actors? KingConCruise.com. That's John St. John's. He's Duke Nukem, has a, a, video, a voice actor convention on a cruise liner going to the Bahamas. And I'm going to be there. And I understand that uh, DC Douglas, who's Albert Wesker, Richard F. Carr, who plays the Joker, Ellen Stern, so many voice actors are going to be there just hanging out. We, we go and hang out with everybody who shows. We just sit there, we drink, we play drunk uh, putt-putt on the, <laughs> on the ship. We go out and uh, uh, snorkel and look at tropical fish together. Then we go eat the tropical fish the next While day in drunk. the Bahamas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it's just a blast. We have our panels, my Voice of Palooza panel we normally do, which is a lot of fun. And we just finished the, uh, I just finished Voice of Palooza, uh, the charity arm of it, which was voicepalooza.com. And we did, uh, we had gamers from all across the globe, all across the globe, basically do streaming games, there were plays. We did some plays. We had a lot of voice actors doing panels. There were about 30 different voice actors who gave their time and came on with us. And we raised $30,000 for the Alzheimer's Association. I lost my mother and my grandmother and my uncle to Alzheimer's. And we've been hearing so many stories from a lot of people about how it's, it's touched their lives. And it's wonderful to know that if they go to ALZ.org, they can always find help and guidance and somebody who's been there can help. So we do what we can, right? Try to bring some light into this world. It may be a dark world, but darkness runs from the light. So guys, always be the light if you can. Wow, we're going to be on the, we'll, we'll be doing something with the Voice of Blues. Thank well you. said, and I'll definitely include a link appreciate in everything. It. Yeah, that would be lovely. I, I, I can't wait to have you guys with us. And this has been fun. I yeah, didn't man. know we started. Yep. So I I apologize for any noses I blew or things that I wiped uh, at the top. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Man, no, it's been my pleasure. Next year, we're going to make it bigger and better with the Voice Blues, and we'd love to have you guys on board. Sounds great. There we go. All right, guys. Let's have a have good evening. evening. Bye -bye. Take care, man. Night. Yeah. All right, folks. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Wes. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs>